Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. I have Julie Kulkin here, one of the co-founders of Pedernalis uh, Sellers, and this will be the third time I've come up here <laughs> to do an interview. And this is going to be, I guess, the second episode of Wine World TV because I'll actually have a, a true like intro episode at the house. I have yet to record that. Um, so we're recording this actually about a month before this is even going to come out. Uh, I think my goal is to come out on the 9th of October, whatever that Friday for that week is. So the 5th of October is the launch date of Wine World TV. And uh, we did a kind of a Zoom call recently and mm -hmm. it kind of, it was a great opportunity to talk with some of the people from the different Texas fine wine wineries. And uh, Julie was like, come on up and see us. Uh, they tricked me and uh, <laughs> on the wine, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I should have known better. and. Uh, so Julie, let's let's kind of talk about what's what's been going on since the last time I was here. And well, when was the last know, time you were here? I um, that was several years. It was episode four hundred, and that was December of two thousand seventeen. Because yeah. I did episode four fifty that May of last year, two thousand eighteen. So yeah, so I usually show up in December, but it's September. Matter of mm. fact, I, I don't know if you already know this. It's my birthday today. So, oh, yeah, it actually is my birthday, birthday today. Um, happy birthday. So you're seeing this a month later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, um, uh, it was December 2017 since so I was here. And um, so and it was great for episode 400. Mm -hmm. I really wanted a special episode. So when I do special stuff. I like to come up here. <laughs> and I, do, I also come up here just to come up here. I don't every it's not like I've only been here three times. I've been here. A lot of times. Yeah, more than it's usually where I bring people from out of town or if people want to know where to go, this is definitely one of the wineries I tell people they have to come to. All right. So what what has happened well, in the last year, year and a half? <laughs> the know. obvious, yeah. Um, you know, we're socially more distant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I wiped down the mic. You know, we got masks. Mm -hmm. um, but so what, what's been going on? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, obviously, like, you know, we've been you know, dealing with the pandemic. I mean, before that, I mean, if you think about if you were here in December of 17, I mean, that was a particularly good vintage we had just had in, in 2017. And those wines are now being released, interestingly enough. So uh, not the whites. The whites obviously have been released a while ago, yeah. but uh, the reds are just now uh, rolling out. I think the wine club this month, we're releasing that 2017 Colkin uh, Vineyards Reserve. So uh, it's very, from a wine perspective, this is a really good time. Uh, it's obviously been a bit rough because of the pandemic. Uh, we, I mean, obviously we were shut down. Like mm -hmm. uh, we did reopen. Um, some winers ch chose not to, but we did reopen in May and June, and then we were shut down again. And there's been a slow reopening. Uh, we're the. the terms under which wineries are being uh, and tasting rooms are being reopened is we, we need to serve more food than we okay. did in the past. And so that has become the challenge. We, I looked at a food truck yesterday. We're going to get a, a basically rent a food truck and have it permanently on site to have more food preparation occur mm -hmm. uh, here. Uh, and it's good. What we're seeing, I mean, at first we we're like, we didn't know how well people would be interested in ordering food, but actually we now have it. So when you make your reservation, you can order some food at the same time. And so we have it ready when you come. And it's, it's actually been really nice. So it was a little rough this weekend because of the rain that we have it to get. So because we are, we're still serving entirely outside. Right. Uh, yeah. The tasting room itself is actually closed. Uh, only the staff go in there uh, just because it's too many surfaces to clean, you know, and mm -hmm. everything. And it's just safer to be outside. Everybody, that's what you hear over and over again. And then medical advice is to stay, you know, outside as much as possible. So. Yeah. Actually, this is the of the three interviews this is the only interview we've ever done inside. We've, yeah. we've sat outside mm -hmm. both times because the weather's been great. Uh, it's even though even being December, it's been great weather every time <laughs> I've come up a little chilly, but not that bad. Um, actually if it's about this temperature, in yeah, December no, usually outside, in December, we're it's in pretty cool in here. Yeah. So it's we're, we're in the, we're in the cellar. Uh, you can't really see it. Um, but I'll, maybe I'll take some pictures, uh, before I leave so you can see what, what we're looking at. Um, yeah, this but, is sort of uh, the, the production crew's little lounge 
Right, and yeah. They have the microwave over here, and they can sit and have lunch <laughs> over here. So that's uh, that's what you're looking at. It's a coffee machine over there. It's a coffee machine. One, one of the guys was like, can I get some coffee? Yeah, we're, we haven't <laughs> started yet. Yeah, um, so a lot of everything outside. Um, when I drove, my walked up, I saw you have like your all your six feet, like mm -hmm. like little markers on the sidewalk, and you've got your table sitting outside um, for when I guess people show up and mm -hmm. do the pickup. Have you been getting a lot of people coming by and picking up? Yes, I mean some people are still. I mean, won't come and do a tasting even, you know, with the with all the precautions that we're taking. Um, because we actually have, if you look at the deck, you know, you, you actually see where you have to walk. I did see that. Yeah, yeah, trying to to create one direction of circulation so people are not coming, you know, against each other. So um, even, but you know, some people are just, you know, I know for whatever reason, either their family or personally, their personal health, they just don't want to come out. So yes, they've been doing curbside. Uh, our wine club members have been wonderful because, you know, we were concerned that a lot of people would decide, you know, to drop their wine club because it's just, it is a pandemic. But no, it's been exactly the opposite that they've really enjoyed, for one thing, to have the wine shipped to them, right, in, mm -hmm. in many cases. Uh, but also just as when we've been open, they say it's, it's just because our property is so large, they feel very safe. They can go out on the right. lawn and they can, you know, it's sort of like going to a park. And when so many things were closed, uh, we were one of the, you know, one place you could go and actually just, you know, be somewhere other than home and feel feel good about it. So, so are a lot of those people local or do you get you know, a lot of people from San Antonio and Austin are making that drive? Because it's about an hour and a half drive for me. It's not necessarily an hour and a half from everywhere in San Antonio, but it's about, but, yeah, for most people, it's about an hour and a half. Yeah, we see, I mean, we're seeing the Houston people as well. You yeah, know, they're making like a weekend or a week yeah, out of it. Yeah, and that'll actually go up because a lot of uh, Houstonians come during hunting season. And yes. their group, you know, comes up, hunts, and then also does the wineries or, you know, sometimes some people are doing the hunting and other people are doing the wineries or whatever. So that's, that is not that far away at this point. So um, anyway, you know, obviously this is, you know, in Fredericksburg, this has been rough, right? It was, you know, when everything was shut down. The only good thing was at the point we were shut down back in the spring, there were only five cases in Gillespie County uh, total. Uh, right. And so and we, those five cases, you know, showed up in like the first week or two. And then it was like living in a bubble. Right. Because the just no one went in, no one went out. And so you effectively had, you know, no exposure to the, the disease at all. That has obviously changed. Uh, and it's taken a lot to get people to start wearing the masks. It really helped that the, the, the governor Abbott finally stepped yeah. up because basically Fredericksburg a week earlier, the mayor had said, that's it. It just we have to start requiring masks. Uh, and that's been the big transition. Um, yeah. So. And I can say, you know, um, while I haven't really talked about it too much uh, over the summer with the episodes I've done, um, you know, uh, and again, I don't really talk where I work, but I, I luckily still have a job. Um, but I really just go to and from work. Mm -hmm. And I only go to my tasting group in person when I host. And I hosted yesterday. It was pretty baller because I brought some really cool wines, but also these are wines I've been buying for years. So it wasn't like I spent, it was several hundred dollars, I guess, worth of wine, not several, a few hundred. <laughs> um, and I brought some champagne, you know, cause you know, celebration, cause I'm not gonna be able to do much tonight. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I got a haircut. <laughs> um, matter of fact, yeah, I don't need to keep the hat on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, so I don't really go out even in Bear County mm -hmm. and you know, I do keep track of what's going on with COVID and how things are trending. So like I told Scott uh, Oda yesterday that because especially Bear County and Texas in general, but Bear County is trending down mm -hmm. that I'll probably feel comfortable showing up to taste group in person now instead of over zoom, mm -hmm. which it's hard to, guess the wine when you're not tasting it but at the same time it's a great exercise in theory and over the last several months it's harder and harder for me to guess correctly because i'm not tasting the wine because yeah. i'm not really i mean i'm working my theory but sometimes the descriptions aren't matching what i need right. and it's helpful to really taste the wine uh to do that so i think um depending on work schedule i don't almost never work monday morning so yeah, I mean, I'll probably start going to tasting group in person because I think we're trending the right way. You know, we're wearing masks over there. I mean, obviously we can't taste and have masks on, but you know, when we're not really actively tasting, everyone's got their masks on. There's only like four or five of us even in the entire wine bar anyway. So it's not like we have a huge group. 
So is this at High Street? That's High Street, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that that's what we've been doing uh, as far as virtual tasting. But yeah, I mean, this is literally my first trip outside of the city, or the, I technically live outside the city, but I mean, I first outside of Barrett County mm. since uh, I went to Oregon mm. in March. Yeah. So, um, no, but it, we see a lot of that here. I mean, yeah. the, people say this is, this is you know, particularly back in, in June and July, we would have people like this is the first time they had gone out, you know, anywhere. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think people are, I mean, a lot of, yes, the trending has gone down. And I think people also just adjusting to, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't know how long this is going to last, which is one of the hardest things for a business is just the uncertainty of it all. And you're trying to contingently plan how much, you know, how many people can we really employ, right? Yeah. Obviously, we had to keep going. You know, our production staff is, we're full staffed up uh, because you have to bring in the harvest. And that was when, when they shut us back down, it's sort of like, you know, all the wineries still had expenses. All the wineries still had to buy grapes, you know. Uh, and yes, you did hear of wineries not taking contracts because they just couldn't pay for them because right. there was no revenues. So the, the knock-on effects are pretty, you know, pretty serious once you start shutting down like tasting rooms and things like that. So it's nice to see things returning to, yeah. to some extent. Uh, and um, anyway, we'll, you know, we'll see how, you know, how the trend lines go and how quickly they come up with, you know, a, a vaccine of some sort. Yeah. Um, so with, with the fact that you have a lot of wineries that aren't able to fulfill the contracts, are we going to have a, a basically a glut of Texas grapes? Interestingly enough, no. No? Because okay. this is one of the smallest harvests we've seen in a while. It was kind of lucky because we, I mean, we were bringing in less than 50% of what we normally would. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just largely has happened. There was a freeze event last, what's amazing is almost a year ago. Right, yeah. Uh, and that freeze event severely damaged the, the, the vines uh, such that they just didn't put out as many buds. Uh, and it's actually been a learning experience because we would have 10 tons contracted. They they guessed they were gonna take 10 tons off and it would be, end up being two and a half. Right. Wow. And so a uh, lot of the growers are really sort of like, oh, this is a learning. Like I couldn't predict, you know, I couldn't predict how much I was actually going to be able to harvest. And so it's it's been a new experience um, for everyone. And we ended up because many of our traditional suppliers like the Binghams, for instance, were particularly affected. We've ended up taking in lots from new new vineyards that we had not worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. And so that's been interesting. We've done a lot more hand harvesting in the High Plains than we do normally. Normally we do a lot more machine harvesting. So it's been a different vintage, but yeah, it's a smaller one. Uh, luckily okay. we're riding on several really pretty good years. And so we'll feel this in two years, particularly like the reds, but like the whites were okay. It's fine. You know, if we skip over the vi vintage and, and a number of those programs, uh, and yeah, in, in two years we will be sort of like grasping about <laughs> looking for more red wine. I know it's the case, but I mean, if we could have picked a year that just naturally there were fewer grapes, this probably would have been it because it's just right. it's a lot less expensive. Yeah. So. And it's a good reminder that like when you have that type of frost damage and was that more of a winter kill or was well, it just frost it was, damage it was just what happened was the plants were not i don't know if you remember last year's harvest went forever right mm -hmm. this is like the short one of the shortest ones we've ever had because it's basically done we have the last of the grapes you know yeah going to barrel in the, in the next week or so and then that's that uh whereas last year it was we were picking grapes in october uh in the high plains and basically we finally were picking because there was going to be this freeze, right? And so the plants just hadn't gone dormant yet. They were still trying to ripen out. And so they were just very exposed to that yeah. freeze. So we don't usually have the problem of an early fall, what, an early fall freeze. We usually have a problem with late spring freezes. Mm -hmm. Right. But that year in 20, well, it's, it was actually in 2019, we had a late fall. Uh, yeah. Late, yeah. Early I, fall freeze. I got it. to uh, hang out with uh, Neil Newsom last mm -hmm. year, last May. Uh, he was kind enough to let me stay at the B&B, too. Nice. Um, so that was really cool. Hung out with um, him and Janice and then Simon, who I don't think he's with. I, I don't know if Simon's with him anymore. But, um, you know, almost every day I saw three of them. Mm -hmm. And then got to see VJ, hung out with him. And Bobby Cox was a really cool person. He's really, he's a character. Yes, he's um, a character. <laughs> Kim, you know, Kim uh, McPherson. Mm -hmm. And um, now I can't, uh, Jason Santani. 
-hmm. over at Yano. So, I mean, I had a really good visit out there in the, in the high plains and, um, uh, it, so it was one of the fun things, funny things about that was we talk about how the high plains is where a lot of our grapes are coming from, mm -hmm. but it's a, such a huge area that it's not like you're going to Napa and it's just vineyard on vineyard on vineyard. Yeah. Even out here, it's like, you don't really see the vineyards that much. Um, and I know they're all over the place, but mm -hmm. the hill country is the second largest AVA in the country Yes, behind the upper Mississippi, upper Mississippi Valley, um, AVA. Um, a flashcard for you, um, <laughs> cause sometimes people call the hill country the largest and it's actually not. Um, but it's still pretty big. Yeah. No, yeah. It is. And it's a lot of, the thing about the hill countries is a lot of smaller vineyards, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, whereas in the high plains, when you do run into a vineyard, it's very often substantial. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, um, so I went to, um, Leahy, and it's just it's huge, right? Mm -hmm. You just you go out there and you're just like it's oceans of gray of, of vines. So whereas right. you know our vineyard is 17 acres, right? Which is you know which is actually a pretty good sized vineyard in the yeah. hill country, crazily enough. Uh, but it's it would be I mean barely noticeable on the high plains. So so speaking of that, that was originally where we were going to start today, but it's crappy outside. Um, it's not really good drone flying weather. Uh, it's somewhat rainy and the wind is okay, but it's the rain. So the idea was to, uh, go to all these vineyards mm -hmm. this week. Uh, cause well, one, I've actually never been to their vineyard because mm -hmm. it's not on site. Um, and actually there's a lot of wineries that don't necessarily have vineyards on site or if they do is like a show vineyard. Um, I mean, they do harvest grapes there, but it's not like their yeah. productions coming from there really. Um, but, uh, the intro that you saw, which, have yet to record um <laughs> is supposed to be in a vineyard this is assuming it works this week um and that vineyard shot is good was going to be either their vineyard or one of the other vineyards or i'll or rotate through i don't know how i was going to do all this but i wanted a vineyard shot and where's the closest vineyards to me well the hill country and who do i know well i know julie <laughs> and i know ron and i know some other people and i was like hey can i take take my drone too so um the whole reason i even have a drone is so i can do these things mm -hmm. but uh so yeah um let's talk let's talk about uh what you have over at colkin vineyards yeah colkin vineyards i um, interesting if we're doing replanting uh we will be doing it uh, this was the first year we'll do it again next year and then we'll have one more block so it's a three-year replanting mm -hmm. uh to the 50 percent of what we have is tempranillo and that we're our we're planting, replanting with more Tempranillo. Uh, but then we also are, put, uh, we've planted some new stuff, some um, Petit Syrah, which mm -hmm. we had never had before. We're planting some more Sangiovese. Um, we're having a hard time replacing the Portuguese varietals that we have, uh, the Tenta Amarela and Tenta Cal. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with those, because they've been wonderful, wonderful fruit to have in the vineyard. Uh, they bring a completely different taste profile. Uh, but we have called all the nurseries in the U.S. and there just isn't any healthy stock available. Right. So because I think I think it's in that case they discovered what they originally brought over was diseased, and so now okay. uh, in effect they have to restart over that whole process. And so. that's a many year process, right? They have to quarantine basically the the vines if yeah. they bring them from somewhere or if they bring them from Portugal, Portugal in yeah. that case. Yeah. So anyway, we'll, we'll, it's not, unfortunately it's not going to be in the window where we want to, we may end up with more Tempranillo as a result, okay. but there is quite a bit of Tempranillo stock uh, available. So, uh, and yes, we have, uh, we have Grenache, which we will replace for our GSM Melange program, mm -hmm. the Rhone style. Uh, we have more Uh We do not have Syrah uh, that we've, uh, we've found that it sources better from, uh, the high plains although i know ron gets some from west texas which is also very nice okay so, like like what not high plains but like west west texas like west, by west Al, texas. Al, like el paso or fort stockton or something like that yeah somewhere in that area okay. there's the davies mountains you, you yeah, yeah, ask, yeah 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 ask ron obviously he knows exactly yeah. where he's getting it from so uh but there are some some vineyards out there and it just i think it's just the cooler weather they need mm -hmm. than, than we have here so and Syrah is a kind of finicky grape anyway so yeah uh, but anyway so no, we never grew our own Syrah uh, we will be getting rid of finally probably all of the Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot because that's what my parents originally uh, planted back in 1995 because that was what people would buy right. those varietals uh, and what we found and it was 
you know, for those who don't know the story, I mean, my family grew grapes for a decade before we started Pedernales Cellars. So, you know, in that decade, we learned a lot about growing grapes uh, and particularly realized that like Cabernet Sauvignon, yes, you can grow it well in Texas, but you're really struggling. Whereas, you know, you try to grow Tempranillo here and it's like Tempranillo is a happy here, right? right it's, yeah. it's much more well suited. So uh, anyway, obviously we weren't going to pull vines out, you know, just to pull them out. Uh, but anyway, we finally will be, we will not be replanting them. Right, yeah. So, uh, and the same goes for the Malo. There's just no reason. Merlot grows a little bit better than the cab. The cab is just, I mean, it's, it's a more difficult plant. It needs, it really needs that long growing season. And you just don't get that in Texas. We mm -hmm. have a short growing season. Um, yeah. And that's really the problem is you get those pyrazines that just never you know, grow out, right? So you just, you still have that green flavor, so. I like that. Oh, you <laughs> too much of it. <laughs> well, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want it overwhelming. I don't want to like taste like jalapeno and bell pepper necessarily. And that's all I get, Chinon, which actually, if it's Chinon and that's what yeah. it is, I know what I'm getting. And, yes. But, um, but a touch of it, I don't mind that. Oh no, I don't mind. Yeah. I, don't, I don't mind a touch of. I mean, because I know like the California style of Cabernet Sauvignon has almost none. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, I have to say that I do like the French style that leads. You know, some of that is still right. still active. And yes, I really like Cabernet Franc, which is a much greener mm -hmm. than Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, but here, I mean, Dave was my brother as you know, head winemaker. I mean, he yeah, he so was once asked, you know, what was your least favorite wine? And it was actually the Ca Cabernet Sauvignon from our vineyard, way, way back in 2007, way back yeah. early days. I was our first vintage was in 2006, so that would have been the second second vintage and he said it's the only time he put Cabernet Sauvignon by itself in a bottle he said never doing that again <laughs> yeah not here at least so uh. so um when I was when I was preparing for the drone stuff I was looking at the the, sal the salad image you're talking about you have new blocks is that kind of stuff maybe I I don't know how old those those pictures are that I can see but I see obviously there's like a section that's obviously vineyards mm -hmm. um and it's I guess it's the the road that goes into the vineyard. I guess it's the southern part. Mm. It like, looks like there's places where you could plant stuff north of that. And then, I guess, west of all that, there's like open areas. So that's probably where you're going to be replanting or? Yeah, no, I mean, we're just going through. And I mean, we're literally, you know, taking out old vines and putting in new ones. Okay. Uh, we were seeing, I mean, just, we had viral pressure uh, yeah, that we, okay. we needed to replace the vines. So, but yeah, the, the vineyard was, my parents originally planted about four acres in front and right on 16 yeah. uh, north. And then I don't remember how many years later, well, I guess it was in 2007 was when we did the planting of the back vineyard, okay. which is the larger section. It was much yeah. larger. Uh, and there had actually are some breaks in that. I mean, we there's more room where we could plant. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, I mean, sadly enough, we did plant one section of it to Tanat, and turned out those vines were diseased from oh, the wow. nursery. Yeah, it was really frustrating. So, um, I don't know, but that just happens. They're plants. They, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, we always talk about the front vineyard, the back vineyard, and the front it, vineyard yeah. is we actually call it block zero, which is what my parents originally planted, and then the back vineyard is block divided into zero. <laughs> That's like all scientific and stuff. Yes. <laughs> well, the back the back is block one, two, and three. So. Because I've debated whether my first episode of the new show will be episode zero <laughs> or episode, or episode one. one. Actually, my behind the scenes show, which you should watch if you're into video production, not mm -hmm. really wine. If you're into wine, don't watch it. Well, you can watch mm -hmm. if you want. That did start with episode zero. And I did constantly do that. But it's mm -hmm. also because I listened to a, a computer security podcast, mm -hmm. which I've been slacking the last couple months on. And the person who has it has talked about how he wished he had started with episode zero. Interesting. Because he's a computer nerd and all this kind of stuff. I was like, well, I'm kind of a computer nerd. Mm -hmm. Kind of. I'm not as nerdy as that guy is. <laughs> but episode zero. Anyway, mm -hmm. so yeah, um, I like that. Block zero. Block zero. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I know Joanna was going to pop in here. You want to see if we can. Yeah, uh, why don't you see? Yeah, we'll, you... Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll take a little break here and then we'll get Joanna in here and we can, can continue. All right? Perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, so we have Joanna here. Uh, who's one of the winemakers here at Pedernal. She's joining us and she brought uh, a little sample. So before we get into that, uh, Joanna, kind of tell us who you are, how'd you get here, and you know what, what got you into all this? 
Yeah. Um, so how did I get here? Um, I started by your car. I did. Yeah. I drove, (laughs) um, pretty good at it now (laughs) doing it for a while. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been at Petronella since 2016, okay. um, and I started working in the vineyard, um, just sort of as a vineyard hand at that point. Um, so this has been a career change for me. I kind of had done nonprofit work mostly um, up until 2016. Um, on the side, I was doing wine tastings. I was doing um, basically wine demos for a distributor in Austin for well, about five years, actually, before I decided to kind of make a jump and do try and do wine things full time. Yeah. Um, and you know, they had a really great portfolio. I was learning a lot. Um, I've always had an interest in food. My family's big into cooking. So why the wine thing went really well with my interests, um, naturally. So, you know, I kind of started getting, um, more and more interested in it and more and more kind of burned out on social work, to be honest. Um, and started looking for jobs out in the hill country and saw the posting for the vineyard job. Um, and wasn't really expecting to take it, honestly. I was just sort of feeling out what it, the industry was like in Texas. I really didn't have a whole lot of idea what to expect. Um, but after I met with the vineyard manager and David and just kind of got a feel for what it could be like, I decided to go for it and okay. kind of basically just worked my way up from there. So, yeah, right. Joey, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joey. Yeah. Joe, Joey. <laughs> it's, and it's an interesting thing about the industry that Joey Bagnasco, he has, uh, what's the name of it? Valley Mills Vineyard. Valley Mills Vineyard. Uh, and a lot of people, I mean, actually start in another winery. That's actually oh, yeah. very common that someone who ends up with their own winery. In his case, he actually just wanted to see what a, lar- a larger operation looked like uh, mm-hmm. than what he had as his family. Uh, so he worked for us for a year, uh, and then he went back and works full-time with his family. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, anyway. Yeah, well, very cool. So your role here now is... Uh, winemaker. Winemaker, all right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. pretty obvious, I mean, but just, you know. Yeah, just, now Dave, <laughs> my brother, it's, it's, he calls himself an executive winemaker. Executive but winemaker. to some extent, it's really true, but Joanna's <laughs> making all the real decisions, the harvest decisions, you know, the blending decisions. And Dave's kind of just saying, yeah. <laughs> for the most part, at this point, if I'm going to make a pretty big stylistic change, I'll be like, Dave, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And for the most part, he's fine with all of them. But, you know, obviously, since he's been the head winemaker for and since Petronella started, um, I'm trying to keep in line with what the the vision for the wines have been, right, yeah. while still obviously making some of my own okay. stylistic decisions. So, so um, when we were doing the uh, so the Texas Fine Wine uh, Association, which Petronella is a member of, had a Zoom tasting um, back. I guess it was almost a month ago at this point. Yeah. It was in August, right? I think it was the end. Yeah, yeah it was the end of August. And, yeah, um, we. Um, uh, it was a Zoom call, so we had different representatives. And um, what was I? Oh, so they did a blind. It was a blind thing, mm-hmm. and so we we were to, everyone on the call was supposed to guess what they thought the wines were. And then what would happen is they would give us like a choice of three. So I decided to try to game the system. And when I really couldn't quite figure it out, and I'm trying to use my deductive tasting, I was telling Julie off camera that. Since I haven't been going to tasting group in person, it's harder and harder to over Zoom to hear descriptions and come up with the right answer. But I've been pretty successful, as successful as the people who are in the room, let's put it that way. But the last couple times have been really a struggle for me to get the right conclusion. But um, so with the Petronalis wine, uh, there was Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, and it wasn't Tempranillo. It was something else. As a Alianico. Alianico. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I know for sure they don't have an Alianico. <laughs> but I know they have Cab, but I haven't seen a Malbec from them. So I, so I was like, it's a Cab. And it was Malbec. <laughs> so I was really upset that I – not that I was like, oh, this is Malbec because I have a hard time with Malbec anyway. So Texas Malbec, forget about it. I'm not going to guess Texas Malbec necessarily. Um but yeah, I did that with every winery, but the first one was the most obvious and that was bending Ooh. branches and it was peak pool blanc. And I was like, I was like, and not that I have a lot of experience drinking people, but I was like, people blanc. And I was like, well, this makes the most sense for what I'm getting out of it and looking at the grapes that I had to choose from. And so I got that one. Mm. And so I was one out of five. <laughs> so horrible, horrible. Well, we did kind of game that a little bit. Like I didn't have a Tempranillo right in the lineup. I had a yeah. Malbec, which... 
you know, for, for and Dave, analysis. Dave, the same thing. He didn't have an Italian. So, he had a so Dukeman, <laughs> if you logo way back into my history with, with Leet Wine, um, I, I interviewed Dave Riley. And again, I'm looking at what was the, the, the choices and only was only one that was there. It was a Montepulciano, I think. Yeah, that's what uh, we thought everybody would guess. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, it's Dave. It's Dukeman. It's Montepulciano. It's, majority of their stuff is Italian. They do have some non-Italian stuff, but they do really well with it. And yeah, I was like, and he, he was the Tempranillo. I was like, man. No, his was a GSM. A GSM was his was a GSM. Ron, was a temp- a uh, Ron was, Ron, who we'll be seeing, I'll be seeing in a couple uh, days, but you'll see in a couple weeks. Uh, he had the Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, it was, kind of, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but anyway, mm-hmm. so, um, that was just a long way to say they're doing new things here, which one of them is Malbec. Um, so what do you got new besides the Malbec and this pet nat? Yeah. This yeah. is not, this is not, you know, fruit juice. Well, I guess it is fruit juice, but it's, it's alcoholic yeah. and fizzy fruit juice. Yeah. Um, so I mean, new, this has kind of been an interesting vintage where, um, you know, there was a lot of freeze damage in the high plains. And mm-hmm. so we uh, weren't able to get, the, the blocks contracted that we would normally because they didn't exist this year. Um, so we actually got some different things that are newer, um, or maybe newer in the last few years. It's been a while since we've had some of these. So we've got some Roussan right now, which we haven't had since 2016. Chenin Blanc, since we haven't had since we don't remember when. Yeah, like 13 um, or so. I mean, it's yeah. been a long time. So excited about that. Um, what else do we have that's... Uh, just a couple of new vineyards that we're working with. Um, so that's been sort of exciting. Right now in Tank, we have um, some of the last lots we got in were Alicante Boucher and Cinso, Um, both of which I really love. They came in on the same day from the same vineyard, and I decided to co-ferment them for a couple of different reasons. Um, so I'm really excited to see how that turns out. I think it'll be a really interesting, kind of fun lot. Kind of get the best, hopefully, of both of the qualities of okay. those grapes because they're pretty different. So, kind of talk about that. So, um, for those of you who don't know, Alicante Boucher is one that I can never pronounce this word. Tintier? Tinturier. Tinturier. So, that just means it's red juice instead of clear juice. It's like, I thought, I thought it was only five, but apparently there's more than five, I guess. But it's a limited many. Yeah, there's yeah. very, very, very few. <laughs> so, yeah, it gets, you know, they get the color from the skins. But um, is co fermenting that with a, a non Tinturier grape, is that going to do something with color stabilization or add extra color? I mean, so kind of besides you just want to see what it does, what, what will that do in a, in a winemaking perspective? Yes. I mean, the Alicante came in extremely ripe. Um, okay. Sugars were super high. And I mean, it, so that's not just the color comes from the, the pulp itself is red. Yeah. So um, mm-hmm. if people can picture that. But so it's highly pigmented. Um, it was super ripe. This And so it tends to come in a little, it doesn't quite get the sugar every year that um, we would hope to get for a red wine. Um, but together they're basically in like this perfect spot. So since okay. so also ends up being pretty, um, can be pretty light bodied. It doesn't have a lot of color at all. Um, that's why it's typically here. At least we use it a lot for rosé. It makes a really beautiful mm-hmm. rosé. It has these nice, really strawberry flavors and aromatics. And, and Alicante is really rich and really dark um, and has this whole like different range of aromatics. And in the past, we've had um, some success, some, some challenges, I guess, with uh, blending it. Basically, it's it can be a little overpowering. So a little okay, bit goes yeah. a long way in a blend. So I was curious to see if we blended these two, both grapes I really love, if we get something um, that just from the outset is um, kind of a little more, what's the word? A little more balanced, I guess. Okay. Um, because again, they are they're kind of on opposite ends of the right. spectrum. Right, kind of taking the extremes and coming up with a happy medium type of thing. Yeah, so that's, yeah. The, that's the goal. Right now it's tasting pretty nice, but it's not done fermenting. So it's sort of hard to... To get, I was going to bring you a sample, but it's in a little bit of a weird place. I'm not sure that you would have enjoyed it. Well, we can do it off camera because I would love to try that. But we, sure. we don't have to do that on camera. So I probably cut out what we just talked about um, So because um, it's the new version of the show. So what's what's in here? Uh, we got a little pet net. So what do you, what do you have in there? Yeah, so that's um, uh, basically a rosé of Tempranillo from the Hill Country mixed with I think it's like 1% of Sangiovese also okay. from the whole country. <laughs> um, the yield on that was really low. So oh, we, yes, we decided sir. just to press it and add it. Sangio, I think in the hill country is actually really awesome. Typically, um, and it holds its acid really well and 
if we had more of it, we would have made really wonderful red wine. But mm-hmm. uh, we had a little bit that helped kind of balance out some of the acids of the Tempranillo, which tends to be lower acid. Right. Um, so yeah, it's Tempranillo. It's fermented to, it's about 1.4 bricks right now. So about, about one brick, we'll put it in a bottle and let it kind of finish fermenting in there. And then we'll have okay. our pet nat. So for those of you who don't know what a pet nat is, that just, that just means like, in well... It's only one single fermentation in the bottle. It's not a second fermentation like champagne or champagne style. So you go full fermentation and then you – this is the really basic way. You ferment it and then you're okay, the wine's finished but still really tart and acidic because you don't have fully ripe grapes when you make sparkling wine. And then you, uh, and then you add some little go-go juice, basically tirage. You know, that's not, that's, uh, not dosage. All these French terms sometimes get me. <laughs> Tirage is the aging. Dosage, right? Yeah. yeah. Dosage is when you put a little, like, little bit of yeast and sugar in there, and that gets kicks it in. And you bottle it, and then you get the get all the bubbles in there. So in this case, the fermentation will finish in the bottle, but there was not a. It was it was didn't finish, and then they restart the fermentation. So it's kind of weird because we have secondary fermentation in two different ways, and. It gets confusing when you're first studying. You don't oh, we need second fermentation. I don't. I, but that's champ. Uh, anyway, I digress. So now, so you're gonna when you get down to one bricks, which is just a sugar level measurement, um, you'll bottle it and it'll finish its it'll finish its fermentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the plan. So pet nat sort of it's a really rustic way of making um, sparkling wine. It's sort of a, an easy and easy. Uh, it's not necessarily easy, but it's a kind of a funner, more rustic, less yeah. um, fussy way of making a sparkling wine. Because again, yeah, you're just finishing that primary fermentation in bottle, uh, but you're trying to get it at the right level of sugar, which is tricky to do um, because you you bottle it too soon and it's too much pressure. You bottle it too late and there's not enough pressure um, to create the bubbles and the carbonation that you expect in a sparkling wine. So it's really specific on timing, which can be a little bit frustrating at times when you're in the middle of harvest and you're trying to do a bunch of other things, but also <laughs> bottle this wine. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just the time, the timing is the most important thing on it. But, um, other than that, it's a pretty easy way to, or simple way, I guess. Not easy so if something like this sparkling. would, and I was just say I guess pet nats in general, cause I, 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 well, I know a lot. I also don't know way more than there's, so when you're bottling this, um, as far as the fresh, the final pressure, it's going to be significantly less than, than champagne. Yeah. It's going to, it's not going to be like that five, I guess it's supposed to be four to six atmospheres with the six is at six ish atmospheres. We're probably like close to like a two or three, maybe, or I've never, one. Measured, we don't have the technology to measure it, but it'll uh, be, yeah. <laughs> but so yes, it, definitely but it, less than champagne. Yeah. You don't need, you don't need champagne, like you bottles. don't need champagne strength bottles. No. no. Yeah. And we, we cap them. We don't cork them. Yeah. Uh, Cause most pet nests are just like crown caps. Mm-hmm. I've, yep. So we crown cap them um, and lay them down to finish their fermentation, and yeah. then they'll be ready by the spring for sure. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's give this let's give this a go here. Mm-hmm. So one of the cool things about what I get to do and going to wineries is occasionally I get to try things like this that are either tank samples, barrel samples, things like that. And and not that you can't ever get that at wineries when you when you like take tours and all that. Um, but it's kind of fun to be able to do this, and it was one of the perks. I started 11 years ago doing, well, actually my first interview was probably 10 years, 10 ish years ago, but yeah. So it's kind of the perks to be able to do that. And so this helps me with my, um, studies. So like, this will be the first time I've had something like this as a pet nat or the, the, the future pet nat. So mm-hmm. I've yet to have like a Vin, Von Claire or Vin Claire for, which is the, the still wine before they make it into champagne. Because I haven't been to Champagne yet to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's going to be a little bit sweet, obviously, because you want there to be sugar to mm-hmm. finish that fermentation. This is also probably a little less carbonated than um, uh, coming out of the tank, even because we have to degas it some to get it an accurate measurement on it. Right. Um, so just picture that a little less, a little less sweet and more bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's really cool, you know. When so, Joanna uh, walked out while we're. Julie and I were talking, and that's when we did the stop. And I was like, "Yeah, she had a glass of Beaujolais Nouveau, which this is not really that, but I mean, or whatever, but or fruit juice. But it is fruit juice, but it's it's got a little bit of alcohol in there. I mean, it's not going to sure, yeah. It's not going to. It's not finished yet, but it'll be pretty low in alcohol anyway. Yeah. Honestly, our pet nets generally are um, just 
we're picking for acid as well. Yeah. So, and we're not doing a dosage. So the alcohol will probably be around 10 or 11 percent, honestly, yeah. by the time it's finished. Um, this vintage is a little bit different because we're pulling Tempranillo from a different vineyard. Um, I also, we don't always inoculate all of our lots, and this we did inoculate. Um, and I use a different yeast this year, which I'm pretty excited about. I feel like it came out super clean, really fruity, um, and really kind of crisp and clean. And I think it'll yeah. be a nice sparkling. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's like a good mixture of like, I get a little bit of herbaceous and grassiness out of this, um, along with like, you know, overriding of strawberry and just red berries. So, I mean, it's, it's not quite like a Hawaiian punch type of thing, but it's a very fruit juice driven type of thing. But you get a little bit of that, that, um, I would say kind of grassiness or, or green, not green, but like leafiness and rusticity and when you first put on the palate, it's all fruit. And then when I swallowed it, then that, that herbaceousness came through again. And there's like, um, like I'll, I'll, I also feel like I'm getting kind of the, the actual, like being out there in the vineyard and smelling like the leaves and the, and I don't know what bark necessarily smells like, but that type of aromas, this is really cool because yeah. Yeah, when that one was about halfway through fermentation, it smelled and tasted sort of like those pink Starbursts, which are the mm. best Starbursts everyone knows. <laughs> um, so that was pretty fun. I don't necessarily want pink Starburst sparkling wine, but it was fun in the middle of that fermentation. Right, yeah. It was still pretty sweet. So, And, I mean, the tartness is there. I mean, there's definitely a lot of acid in this, um, which we've already alluded to that you want in sparkling wine. Um, that's why you don't have fully ripe grapes for sparkling wine because then it comes out flat. Well, to flat tasting, it's, it's, I guess you still get bubbles, mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, I mean, you got that you got that tartness in there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because the Sangiovese is you, even though one percent, it's like just giving it enough acidity to really keep it bright and fresh. Um, so that's why you drink Chianti with tomato sauce because tomato sauce high acid. You have a high acid wine; they they pair; they're not in conflict with each other. Same way with well, maybe all maybe all high acid grapes too. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those, I know it geeked out a little bit for you, but that's kind of explain what was going on here. But yeah, this is really cool. Uh, thank you for We're that. We're excited yeah. about it. So yeah, this is our third pet nap. So yeah. the first one we could not, uh, we could sell it by the glass. We couldn't sell bottles uh, because we were afraid that it just might explode. <laughs> yes, it's been a learning experience. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, uh, well, it I've, tasted great, but yeah. it was just unsafe <laughs> yeah well i've seen yeah, and sure. i've seen it feels like maybe over the last two or three years there's more pet nets coming out of texas yeah. um is that something is there something of a reason for that because um not to get too far down the rabbit hole but i know that a lot of times we struggle with acid with grapes in texas mm -hmm. um but yeah. i guess if you pick early enough it doesn't really mean you have the acid no, I think it's a desire to have sparkling wine uh the the reality is that no one in texas has made the investment to actually put in a champagne line, right? It's an yeah. extremely, extremely expensive thing to do. Um, and so barring that, you then say, okay, well, what can we do in Texas? And the Pet Nat has been a style of sparkling. And it's had a, I mean, I think it's just had, also had a, it's, it's, it's popular, you know, yeah. and it's not just here that people are making them. It's just, it's just a style of wine that people are like, open to right now mm -hmm. but the, the thing about a pet nat as opposed to champagne is the fact that you still have some of the leasiness in it but you never disgorge it and get, mm -hmm. get rid of it like you do with champagne and so it does have yeah it's got a funkiness to it particularly if you drink all the way to the bottom of the yeah. bottle so and the yeah, i wish you'd see it in the cloudiness right now you can see yeah that. i mean I, I don't know how much you can tell i mean we're pretty far away i'll I won't have the door behind me um, but it's, I mean, it's really very, very cloudy. I mean, it's, it looks like it's like just the pulp. Like mm -hmm. you just squeeze like basically a, a pink grapefruit. That's, <laughs> it doesn't taste like pink grapefruit, which that would be fine, but it'd be really, really tart unless you put a ton of sugar in it. But yeah, it really has that, that look to it. I mean, that'll, of course, settle. Is, in active fermentation, everything's in suspension. So all yeah. the, the yeast and the lees and everything are, are, in, are in suspension. So when it finishes fermenting, that'll settle. It'll be the clear. Bottom. You'll have the cinnamon on the um, bottom. It'll, it'll be mostly clear. So. Yeah. And that's what, if you've never had a pet net, you'll see that a lot. You'll have a little cloudiness. You'll have the sediment at the bottom. And it's totally natural. Um, it's like drinking an unfined and unfiltered wine. I mean, especially when it's like a white wine, it's really noticeable. Um, and it's totally fine. It's not, you know, that's how it used to be done. 
I mean, filtration was very, very coarse and finding, I guess you've been finding for a long time. Mm-hmm. But the finding agents existed. Yeah. yeah sure. But yeah, you had a lot of cloudy wines. So, mm-hmm. but yeah. Um, um, I mean, I've, I've had a few pet nets from other Texas wineries and they all were really cool and they taste really good. And like I said, I mean, having something sparkling and having gone to Gruet, I went, I went to Gruet last year. That was like my 15 hour side trip from Plains, mm-hmm. Texas. <laughs> um, anyway, that was an awesome trip though. Um, but seeing the actual, like the whole process, mm-hmm. I, I got there at the right day. They were doing everything that was part of champagne process. Mm-hmm. The only thing I needed to go, I needed to do was go to the barrel room because it was like eight miles away, so they, it's not on site. But yeah, um, yeah, it's an expensive process. There's a reason why champagne method is expensive. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's also very involved. You don't just do it on the side. You know, like, yeah. You're, yeah, you have to really dedicate a lot of time to doing it correctly. Yeah, yeah. it's it's it, there, there, yeah, there's a reason why that that stuff is expensive. I mean, yes, you can get cava. It's, it's champagne method. But they also have a lot lower costs mm-hmm. in Spain, so it's not like you know having to charge fifty bucks for champagne method sparkling. That's why English sparkling wine is expensive because it doesn't labor costs. It costs high. a lot of money to yeah. do this type mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, it's high. It's both a machinery, but it's also high labor, mm-hmm. labor yeah. intensive. And so, I think Spain has the advantage; has always had cheaper labor mm-hmm. uh, traditionally. So. Um, I, I'm always amazed when I go and I look at a cava. It's like 10 here, bucks. It's 10 bucks. I'm like, how did you get here? I mean, it's yeah. just, the fact that it could be made and then, you know, imported, it's just the amount of money they're making on it. It's just, it's gotta be tiny, but they just do it in enormous volumes. Mm-hmm. So as she said, once you do the investment, you're going to do it like full yeah, on. Yeah. You have you to, know. you have to really go into it. Yeah. Um, so besides pet nat and we kind of, Briefly talk about some of the other grapes. Anything else new happening with you guys? Uh, you have any new blends that are going to be on the horizon? Mm. I know yeah, that. I know that a couple years ago was head, my. But, you had a yeah. Grand Reserve that's going to come out. Oh uh, yeah, In we do. Twenty twenty one though. Twenty twenty one will be released. Yeah, so December twenty twenty one. I think. All right, and that's still. I mean, it's the first time we've done. And again, you can geek out on what the you know what it requires to do a Grand Reserve style. Yeah. Uh, Tempranillo. So that, I mean, that's several years. We're not talking a couple. So Grand is what, four? Five, total, five, five, years. five total years. Yes. And if you're following Rioja, it's, I think it's like, what, three in barrel, two in bottle, or the other way around? I can't remember. Yeah, I think, I think it's a minimum two in, At least in, two, in barrel. Two barrel, three bottle, yeah. five years total. Um, so, yeah, and depending on which Rioja house or winery you're getting it from, you know, they may release it as Reserva, but the thing has like 10 years of age to it. Like mm-hmm. Lopez de Heredia is like the one that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, um, so a Grand Reserva next yeah. year, that would be really cool. Yeah, and that's just, fun. yeah, it's, I mean, that was one of the, I mean, I talk about things that have changed. I mean, even when you're looking, I think, I mean, we got better about it, but it was about 16, 17. We started getting better about just holding things back, right? Because uh, so we had a terrible vintage in 2013. Mm-hmm. And you started to really see the impact of that like, two years later, as I was mentioning mm-hmm. earlier. Uh, and so we kept accelerating our releases. And finally, I, I think it was the 2016 temporary service. I was just like, we can't do this, right? The wine will be better. And I think we waited eight months. And so we didn't have it on the menu, which I almost always like to have the temporary reserve on the menu. Right, yeah. And I said, no, this just got a bottle age. It's going to be better if we wait. Uh, and it was. It was we, you know, that was... Uh, you know, that was the wine we sent a uh, second time it's happened, but we did get a double gold at, at San Francisco <clears throat> international yeah. wine competition, because it was ready at the point we finally released it. And right, so, yeah, yeah, then to really get into, you know, thinking, you know, that far in advance, we're going to be struggling two years from now, as I said, you know, with the 2020 vintage, we're going to be like really tempted to release some wine, yeah. but anyway, <laughs> uh, because we, we, this is a smaller vintage. Yeah, exactly. So, but, um, but yeah, no, I think, I think it's exciting to, to to take the time and do the bottle aging and really okay. make sure you're releasing it when you should be releasing it. Yeah, exactly. So I know you probably need to get back to doing what you got to do, right? I have a thing or two. You got yeah, a thing or two to do. Care. Yeah, I mean, it's harvest time and it's a fermentation going on. And it's always, a, it's always like very humbling when winemakers uh, allow me to hang out with them during harvest. Um, I was hoping to time it better where Hill Country and, and High Plains Fruit 
<laughs> but it's, it was yeah. a hard year to time. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say it was really pretty <laughs> steady, and then it's done. <laughs> yeah, or we're so, getting ready to barrel some things down. That's yeah. we're gonna pull some barrels down and cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. In the background, you may have heard a little bit. They were they're pulling stuff around. I mean, we're we're in the we're in the barrel room. They're they're they didn't stop everything just because I'm here. <laughs> so yeah, um, you can get back to doing. I'll close the door a little bit so we're not so blown out. <laughs> yeah, I had, we have active fermentations in here as well, so it was pretty. The CO two was pretty. Yeah, there so this yeah, we don't want to like die from a fis- from yeah, no mm-hmm. oxygen. How about yes, that? It's yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, thank you so much You're for welcome. hanging Thanks out with us, and by. Joey and I will kind of wrap things up here in a little bit. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. So we'll be right, right back. So we're back. We're going to wrap things up here. Uh, I want Julie to kind of talk about uh, their protocols and what they're doing here with uh, the pandemic. And uh, so, yeah, we'll kind of talk about how you're how you've adjusted. Yeah. As I said, you know, we um, we do our tastings outside, you know, and it's unless it's absolutely unless it's pouring or something. And then we've we've done them in the cellar downstairs in the, the barrel room. Obviously, everyone wears a mask. Right. It's you know, rare for me to be at work and I don't have my mask on. Um, and yeah, we I mean, we also what's interesting about the guidance that we've gotten from both the governor's office and the TABC is they really have actually treated us very much like restaurants, right? Which yeah. means that you would most, you know, you're expected to, to pour, you know, for people like over their shoulder, like you do. We've actually set it up so that we have an extra table adjoining the table where guests sit. So our staff, essentially, you know, the glasses can be put on this extra table. You can pour from over there and then you can pull them back in front of the guests. And that way there's, we can keep more or less a six foot distance most of the time. Uh, between the guests and our servers, which, you know, for me, it's also for our servers. I want them to be safe, you know, um, because we do have fewer cases out in the Hill Country than you do. Like, you know, I know that, yes, Bear County has gotten better. But uh, we still have a lot of cases. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's an urban area. It's just there's, you know, there's higher yeah. density of people. So, um, but anyway, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, but we are back to being able to, you know, to, to do full tastings, which really makes a huge difference because, you know, it's one thing to go to your central market or your HEB and you're picking from wines that, you know, you've had over and over again. But these, these are most of what you see in an HEB or a central market. Or they make lots of those wines. And so people are familiar with them and they're pretty similar from year to year. And so yeah. once you know, but here, I mean, every vintage is different. We and, you know, people just don't know Texas wine as well. And so they really to be able to do a tasting encourages people to feel safe buying a bottle because they've already tasted it so they know what it's going to be like so. yeah i can say especially you know a place like texas um because there is variation from year to year we don't have like a consistent uh weather like california does i mean yes they have er- er- earthquakes and fires and which they're fires Sorry, again yeah, this year which is really devastating um but as far as just the weather itself it's pretty consistent mm-hmm. from year to year so i'm not gonna say this necessarily spoiled but it, it, it's not as they don't have as many challenges as some of the other parts of the world do like texas does or europe in particular so yeah being able to have that one-on-one interaction with somebody and explaining why the wine tastes different this year or what why why texas wine is the way it is um that it's helpful to be able to do that um especially when you know honestly when the wine is going to 20 25 30 40 dollars Mm-hmm. And they look at, well, I can get the same wine for 15 in California. Well, you get the same variety, but you're not going to get the same flavor. There's a lot of reasons why smaller areas of the world, like Texas, well, really the other 46 states, mm-hmm. why why the wines are the price they are. Not that you can't have a $15 Texas wine. You can. Um, you can you have $10 wines that are at least 75% Texas grapes. Um, it's difficult, but you can do it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, having that interaction with, with your guest helps explain the story. Um, or when you're in the res- restaurant side or the retail side and you're explaining to your customer or your guest, you know, when you're trying to convince them, yes, you should really have this Texas wine because it's really good. And you're explaining to them why it's really good and, and the vintage variation and all that. Having that other person to help explain it rather than just they're in a store or reading a list and there's no one to kind of guide them with that list. Mm-hmm. They, they'll they'll go with what's familiar. Yeah. And well, it's also we, we always do. We all do that. We go with what's familiar, right? Yeah. Well, and there's I mean because Texas, you know, again, we're a warm weather state. 
uh, many of the varietals that we choose, or, or not all of them are familiar to all consumers. So you're right. also working with, with that as well. And we do a lot of what we call Texas two sips where we'll have like our Viognier and we'll have a Viognier Fincondieu, right? Yeah. So you're comparing them to, you know, if you will, their old world counterpart or in some cases a new world counterpart uh, just to get people say, hey, if you like this, you might like this, right? So, uh, and yes, all of that, you know, takes a hands-on, you know, face-to-face -face approach to really say, hey, you know, I can, I can hand select this for you and, and right, show yeah. you what I want you to, you know, to, to experience here, so. Cool. Well, Julie, I know that you also have stuff to do. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to wrap this up. I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with me. It's always a pleasure to come up here. Um, Dad was Dad, – Dad didn't come up. I was like, hey, you're more welcome to come, Dad, but we're, we're just going to do an interview. We're not going to do anything. Probably not going to do the drone. Or if we are, you know – I mean, Dad usually comes with me on my Texas trips, but today uh, he stayed at home. So, um, And he's also 80 years old. Not that it's – it's actually safe for him to come to this county mm -hmm. versus the other way around. But um, and it's not he, he doesn't stay at home the whole time. He he he, he does go out. But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, normally dad would dad would be in the background mm -hmm. watching all this. Hey, the doors opening again <laughs> because there's active fermentation going on. There's doors opening and closing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Julie, thank you so much again for let me uh, come up here, uh, taste some cool stuff, um, and. Uh, it's been a while since I've been up here anyway, so, yeah. and change the scenery. So that's going to do it for everybody. Um, hope you're liking the new format of the show. I know it's only the second episode, only the first interview for the new show. Uh, lots of cool stuff coming up. Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't, honestly, actually, it's September 8th, and I haven't even finalized my new format and everything. So it's all in my head, but I haven't, like, decided exactly how the other days of the week are going to go, but... If I if I did everything right, there are three shows a week, and I'll tell you about it off camera. Um, but yeah, and um, we'll see everyone again uh, next episode.